Hey, we're starting a new series today uh, called The Sacred Echo. Everyone say The Sacred Echo. I want you to repeat it because when I read, showed some of the high schoolers this morning as I was putting some of the final touches on the slides in Sabbath school, um, they thought it said The Scared Echo and they thought it was, sounded like a bit like a horror movie or something. So it's The Sacred Echo. Um, and really, this is a series about helping us to understand um, the practice of silence and solitude when it comes to our faith. Um, and it's, a really, it's actually a really important but very misunderstood spiritual discipline in our day and age. So that's what we thought it's important to talk about here as a church. Um, so that's what this series is about. Now, I know what a few of you are thinking right now. How are you going to do a four-part series on silence and solitude? You are in for a treat, if that's what you are thinking. Today is just day one. Oh, and I'm so excited for the rest. I've seen the plan. It's beautiful. It's going to be awesome. I'll share with you the outline as we get to the end. Um, but hey, let me pray one more time, and then let's get into it. Lord Jesus, we just come to you this morning. We still our minds. We still our hearts. We want to take a moment to focus on you, to put away the things that have happened during our week, even the things that have happened during our morning. And Lord, may our hearts, our our minds, our ears, everything, may may they all just be open. May they be ready to receive the words you have to speak to us today, including myself, that every single one of us today would walk out differently than we came in because we've had an encounter with you, Jesus. We pray all of this in your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. 21st of March, 2020, was the first day of the level four lockdowns in New Zealand. And I remember waking up that morning, this is before my daughter Lacey was born, and the house was dead quiet. I now recognise how quiet it was because I have a three and a half year old, um, But we actually had this really busy road just sort of up the hill from where we lived in New Zealand. And I know I've shared a little bit about this before, but the lockdowns in New Zealand were very, um, very harsh, the first level four ones. Like literally nothing was open. You couldn't get like Uber Eats or anything. Like the only things that were open were absolute emergency services. We couldn't go to the church to film. You had to do everything from your house. So it was really intense. So, but I remember waking up the next morning and I didn't realize that we had this constant white noise at our house because of this like highway up the hill. And I remember waking up the morning, that morning and just feeling like something's off, like something is really strange. And I realized there were no cars on that road. And the absolute strange silence that had descended on my house was bizarre. And my wife and I, we both had to work from home, so we had a little desk set up um, in like opposite ends of the house because she works quietly, I work loudly and talk through everything I do, as you can probably guess. Um, so there were multiple closed doors between us <laughs> when we could. But, um, but I remember that morning, I, I made, my, made my coffee and I, I went out um, before I sort of started working. And I remember just sitting, we had this little deck out the back of our house and just sitting there and it was just dead quiet. I couldn't hear any of the usual kids getting ready for school in the neighborhood. I couldn't hear any of the cars. There were no planes flying overhead. And I know we all sort of share this common memory, but for me, that moment was a real recognition of the silence that I had been missing in my life. And I took time that morning to just pray. And I wanted to take time to just like what I, really my, my, my method of pastoring before that and just being the person I was, I was always listening to audiobooks, I was always listening to podcasts, I was always trying to read something, I was constantly trying to absorb information. I'm still a lot like this. Um, and I was constantly trying to like learn and learn and learn and learn and, and get things done. And I remember, I don't know what it was, but I think maybe the silence had strangely woken me up. I remember that morning sitting down and deciding to not listen to anything. I didn't put a YouTube video on. I didn't put a podcast on. I didn't, I didn't even take my Bible. I know, shock and horror. But I just went out there and I just prayed on the deck by myself in the morning. And I just, I just prayed to myself, 
Jesus, would you speak to me? Lord, I don't really know what this season's like. I don't, I don't know how this is meant to work. But would you speak to me in this season? And, for the, and it's not like in that moment a divine shining light came before me or something like that. Um, I didn't hear anything back. But I knew he was there. And I just started making a habit of it going out every morning and just listening and t- taking time to not just talk to God, but to actually wait for his response. Now, to some of you, that seems a bit crazy, like to just wait in silence for a response. But the reality is, up until very recently, having complete silence in our lives was a very normal part of the human existence. I mean, even seeing um, that slide about when um, Leonie was born, like that there was no Wi-Fi, there was no Facebook, no wagon wheels. I just assumed they have like always existed, you know? Like that was to me, like they were invented, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, I know it's talking about that, anyway, I don't know. But I just thought to myself like, I, I, you know, just reading about like even well before then, like so many humans were, were farmers and they would go out and just be in the quiet of a field working for most of the day or out fishing or whatever it is. Whereas now, um, it's really interesting, I was reading, if you've ever read a book by Cal Newport called Deep Work, um, it's a pretty interesting book, would recommend, he has a lot of stuff, but he had this quote, I actually don't remember what book this was in, but I have it written down, just that it is now possible to completely banish silence and solitude from a human existence. We now live in an age where it is possible for you to never be alone and never be in the quiet, ever. Every single day, it is possible for you to constantly have noise, to constantly have some sort of connection with other humans, to constantly have input in your world. And this is a relatively new thing in the human existence. And so this is why it's actually important for us as a church to talk about this, and not just talk about this as a one-off sermon, but to actually talk about this for a while, because this is huge, this is actually becoming hugely countercultural, to deliberately make time for yourself for silence and solitude, so that you can hear the sacred echo. And so today, in part one, uh, this part is called the, um, if you go to the next slide, please, the quiet place. Everyone say the quiet place. Okay. Maybe you can say shh. (laughs) Okay, all right. Okay, the quiet place. Um, So let me share for you guys a story. Um, And I'm just going to read it because otherwise I'll butcher it. And I know I don't know, some of you are probably like, oh my gosh, Pastor Josh is actually looking at his notes. It's so weird. And I'm like, yeah, I find it weird too. So you're actually going to hear how poorly I read. All right. (laughs) As the Montgomery bus boycott extended from days to weeks to months, as the simmering anger of the white community began to boil, as more and more people made death threats, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s courage began to fade. So if you're familiar with the story, this is after Rosa Parks um, deliberately chose to not give her seat up um, in a segregated segregated bus to like a a white person who was asking because she disagreed with the system. And it was like a protest. And Dr. Martin Luther King was sort of a part of you know, keeping this protest protest alive. So on Friday night, January 27, 1956, Dr. King came home after late, um, late after a tense meeting of the Montgomery Improvement Association and found his family asleep. While he was pacing and pondering the events of the day, the phone rang and an angry voice said, before next week, you'll be sorry you ever came to Montgomery. And Dr. King hung up the phone and walked despondently to his kitchen. He put on a fresh pot of coffee and sank into his chair at his kitchen table. What happened next, he described in his book, Stride Toward Freedom. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. At his kitchen table that night, Dr. King would neither slumber nor sleep. So he turned to God, the insomniac in prayer. Years later, the words still vivid in his memory, he revealed to his followers in the very private moment a desperate prayer and an epiphany. And so he pleads this to God. 
And he says, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I'd never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for justice, stand up for the truth, and God will be by your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared, and I was ready to face anything. This kitchen table epiphany changed Dr. King's life. The inner voice kept speaking to him, and he overcame his fears and fatigue by drawing on the fierce love of God who never slumbers nor sleeps and who was forever at his side. Beautiful story, isn't it? And I was listening to something by John Mark Comer. If If you've never listened to John Mark Comer, just read, just look at all of his books, every single one of them are amazing. John Mark Comer, I absolutely love him. He's so good. But he talks about this story, this exact story that I shared. And he shares this interesting thing. He said, what would have happened if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a smartphone? Or if he came home and put the TV on? You know, like most of us, most of us, okay. Like me, I'm just going to be very blunt. I'm a, you know, I'm a human being. But, you know, you have a bad day. You have some bad phone calls, and somebody's just like, I'm going to make you sorry you ever came down here. Like, I feel like the regular human response in our day and age is I would go home. Maybe I would put on a, I don't know, I don't really drink coffee at night, but like maybe, I, I don't know, I would go home, I would need some sort of comfort food, and I would sit down in front of my iPad or my TV, and I would find something that needs binging in that very moment, and I would watch through whatever series I need to watch through to drown my sorrows away on Netflix, or to like listen to something, or whatever. Like, I just need to get out of this. But instead, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. chose silence. And he chose to pray, and to wait, and to listen in the silence. But if he'd had a smartphone, or if he'd, you know, decided to binge watch television, would we ever really have had this story? Would he have ever heard the voice of God? Would we have ever really had the incredible story that we have of Dr. King? I don't know. I mean, it's hypothetical. But I think to us, how many of us are choosing to fill our life up with so many voices and sounds when maybe in the silence we could hear the sacred echo? Maybe if we chose to step into the quiet place, we would hear the voice of God right now telling us what we need to stand up for in our day, or what we need to be pushing towards. I love the passage of Scripture that Marsha read before. If we can put that up on screen from, from Luke. It says, Yet the news about him, this is Jesus, spread all the more. So that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and he prayed. Now the biggest, the biggest challenge I, I get, and to be honest, and I'm going to be in this boat too, is we talk about like we need to have our quiet time with God, our, our quiet spaces with God. And we think, well, I'm too busy for that. Some of you are probably here right now thinking, okay, here's another pastor telling me how I need to spend my time during the week, things I need to do. He doesn't understand how busy I am. He doesn't understand how many hours I have to work with my job. He doesn't understand what it's like to have X amount of kids or to have to look after this person in my life or what I've got to go through. And I don't, I don't know the individual parameters of every story here. But here's what I do know. I feel busy. But my busyness, when I look at this story, pales in comparison to the busyness of Jesus. He had literally people crowding after him all day and all night. They were following him everywhere, breaking in through the roof of a house just to get to him, following him when he would like go out on a boat to disappear from people. They would get on boats and follow him out to sea, or they would chase him around the shore. The guy could literally not get away from people fast enough when you read through the Gospels. I'm an extrovert, and that's terrifying. I think Jesus was a pretty busy guy. And yet, in spite of his busyness, or maybe even because of this sheer busyness, 
It says he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So we're going to get a bit geeky here. The Greek word there for lonely places, whatever your translation in your Bible is, there are a lot of things it could be translated as. The Greek word is eremos. Everyone say eremos. Oh, fantastic. Great job, guys. Um, this can be um, translated to desert, can be translated to wilderness, can be translated to the quiet place. Jesse gets it. All right. Another pastor. He gets, he gets it. All right. Or it can be translated to the lonely place. Um, a lot, well, often translations will translate this to like desert, which is a strange thing because in that region, I don't know, desert, deserts, it wasn't really deserts. I don't know why we get that idea. Like it was, it was more like wilderness. Um, but the idea is it's a place of quiet and solitude. Um, think in the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the story, the prophet Elijah, he's getting death threats from somebody. And so he runs away. And then it says he goes out a day's journey into the wilderness. And then he goes and sits under a lone tree. So he literally runs away and goes a whole day's journey out in the wilderness, completely alone, completely isolated, out there in the wilderness. And that's where he hears from God, in the quiet place. And yet today, and I'm not, I'm not preaching this sermon from a person who has this all together. This is a recent learning for me. I'm trying to get better at this. I really am. And I've, got, I've still got a lot of work to do. Um, but today, we have this really strange time. Um, and neuro, I, there's a, there was a neuro, neurologist I was reading who talked about how we are currently living in an age where everybody is alone together. We are never truly alone because we are always connected with these. And yet at the same time, we are never truly together because we isolate ourselves with these very same devices. So we have this constant infilling of not getting enough adequate community, but also not getting an enough adequate solitude. And so we have this huge tension where we're getting neither of the things that we truly need as humans. Now, this isn't hating on smartphones. I love my smartphone. I love modern technology. I use it for so many things. But I have to understand how it works with my body and what it's doing to me and how to, and how to use it, not be used by it. Amen. Thank you. Great one. All right. And I love there's this quote by Ronald Rollheiser. It says, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. Or another one from Henry Nouwen, who says, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside, aside some time to be with God and to listen to Him. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're married. Now, some of you, that's very easy to imagine because <laughs> you are married, right? I am married. I can very easily imagine what this is like. But for some of you, you might need to use a bit of imagination here. Would it ever be possible to have a healthy marriage with somebody who you never spent any one-on-one -on -one time with? <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting. <laughs> if you never spend any time talking to, connecting, spending time with the person who you are married to, I'll say, I don't know, I don't think it's possible to have a healthy marriage. Yes, there are going to be seasons where you're going to have less of that. But a healthy marriage has to be built on communicating and spending time with one another. And it's the same with our relationship with God. If we are never adequately actually taking time to spend with God, how do we expect to have a real relationship with God? And so this is what I'm trying to work on in my own life. Um, there's, a, there's a book I want to recommend. If you want to go through this, I'm just going to put the, 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 the uh, magic. Um, the, yeah, there it is. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, sorry, it's not magic. We don't, we don't, we don't do that here. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, Ruth Haley Barton. She has this book called An Invitation to Solitude and Silence. Now, I've only read like 20% of this book, so if the other 80% is total heresy, I am really sorry in advance. But the first 20% is fantastic. Um, but she has this book called An Invitation to Solitude and Silence. And she tells this story in it. Um, where she just is basically her spiritual life is falling apart. She doesn't know what to do, so she goes to this like uh, Christian counselor. And the Christian counselor tells her this Ruth, you are like a jar of river water. 
all shaken up. What you need is to sit still long enough that the sediment can settle and the water can become clear. Like a jar of river water that needs time to sit so the sediment can sink down. And I think to myself, wow, I resonate with that image so much because that is exactly what I felt like before I started learning to do this. And to be honest, in times, I definitely still feel like. But the idea of actually deliberately taking time to let myself be still long enough that things still in my life, that I can begin to hear God's voice clearly. It is difficult today. It is, it is not easy. You have to deliberately take time to do it. And so, look, there's lots I could say on this and a lot deeper that we could go. But I want to start this series off very practical and very simple to start. And if you want to read this book, I would really, I would at least encourage the first 20%. It's fantastic, okay? I mean, whatever's beyond that is, we're going to go on an adventure together. Um, but I, only, I need to clarify one more thing. Let's talk about the difference between aloneness and solitude, because they're different. Aloneness is what all the introverts in the room love. This is when all the people have left and you are sitting at home by yourself in a, under a blanket and a candle with a good book or like a good show, whatever it is, I don't know, whatever you do, maybe, maybe a video game, I don't know, whatever, and you are just like by yourself enjoying no people time. Okay? I'm an extrovert. I don't get it, but do, we, do your thing. You know, do whatever you need. Like I need that sometimes, but sometimes. Okay? All right. Um, but I respect it. It's a beautiful thing, and introverts need that. Solitude is different. It is not just mental health and healing alone time. Um, it is not a preference-based spiritual discipline for introverts. Aloneness is what introverts prefer, sitting down with a good book, watching TV, or whatever, with no, with no one else around. Solitude is intentional time in the quiet with just ourselves and God. No book, no music, no podcast, no inputs, just yourself and God. And I think this is very misunderstood and very lost discipline in the world of the church today, just because everything has become so fast-paced. And this is why I think it's so countercultural, but something we have to grab back. Why do I think this is so important? Jesus was the literal son of God. He came to earth, and he had his ministry here. He died on a cross, right? Incredible story. And he did it for you, and he did it for me, to bring us salvation, to bring the kingdom of heaven, to help us understand who God really is, to help form us into the kind of people he wants us to be. Now, Jesus was fully God and fully man. I know that's difficult to get, to get into our heads and fully understand, but just, just trust me on that for now. We'll put that aside. That can be another sermon later. But... Jesus was the literal son of God, and he needed alone time. He needed, not just alone time, he needed time with just him and God. So why would I think that I can go through life without that when literally Jesus needed it and couldn't go beyond his ministry without it? Just food for thought. Why do we think we can go without something that Jesus thought was absolutely necessary? And again, I'm not saying this to guilt and shame anybody. I'm a pastor and I feel like I should have this totally down packed. But I don't. It's something I'm still learning and still trying to get and still trying to understand. And I have to be very forceful with myself to get it. And I have room to grow. But I'm understanding more and more how this spiritual discipline, how the need for an absolute quiet place to hear the voice of God is so much more needed than I ever realized in my life before. As life has gotten crazier and crazier, I mean, even, to be honest, with my sermon preparation, um, last night I had the amazing privilege of speaking for a youth group, um, and then the youth group decided to meet in Bronte Beach, which was like, great, but I'm like, wow, that's a long way away from us. So, <laughs> um, anyway, it was awesome. But one thing I realized, like, I was sitting on the train, and I was wanting to like, prep myself to get ready for this, and what I realized I actually needed to do was to not, not listen, to not think, to not go through my notes again. I actually just needed to turn it off 
and to just wait. And the train isn't the most amazing, quiet place to do it, but it was enough. And it was very intimate. It was like a small group, and I remember having my sermon notes open, and I'm very deliberate to not show anybody my sermon notes because nobody else could preach off my sermon notes. They are a hot mess. Um, but the reality is I realized the most important thing for my prep, even for preaching, is not that I need more and more and more time to go over my notes. I just need more time to hear God's voice and to hear where he's going to lead me. And it's the same for all of us. And so that is something I've been working on. And I don't know, I'm still trying to work it out. But let me, let me just wrap things up for you today. I can actually invite the band if you guys want to come up now. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 this is my last slide. And Jesus has this command. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, don't think that when you read this, it means like, okay, all I have to do is lock myself in my wardrobe and then whatever I pray for, it's going to get answered. It's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about the blessing of his presence. Sometimes you just need to totally lock yourself away to hear it, to be quiet. And again, um, this is why I love the title of that book that I shared. It's an invitation. So solitude and silence is not a command. This is not a salvation issue. It is an invitation. Jesus is inviting you to experience his presence, to hear his voice, to let him lead you from within. And it's your choice to accept this invitation and experience this. And so if I'm going to get practical, um, I want you to try this exercise for the week. This is the starting point, okay? Okay. If you've got nothing else from me this morning, that's totally okay. But just take this practical exercise away. You might want to write this down. Um, Try just spending a few minutes in total silence and solitude with God. No phone, no music. Um, Find a quiet place in your home or even if you want to go outside in nature, if you're blessed to have a park nearby or if you're blessed to have a backyard in Sydney. Wow, what a blessing that is now. Um, and begin to just even just take some slow breaths and just slow yourself down. Um, for a lot of us, the quiet time is probably best suited to the morning. Um, I know for me, I don't get a lot of quiet time now. My daughter likes to wake up very early. Um, but if I can even just beat her by 10 minutes, you know... <laughs> Um, and I, I really try hard, this is where I'm at, I'm trying really hard to not look at my phone, I don't put my watch on or anything, because my watch gives me all like, the alerts and everything, or the notifications, I try to just not turn any of that on for the first hour of the day, and even to just sit in my bed, and I just think through, often I'll just think through like Psalm 23, and I'm just praying through it in my mind, um, I try not to even like open, I know, I, like I read my Bible, li- This is where I'm at. I read my Bible a lot just in my working day because I'm a pastor. So the first hours of my day, I'm just focusing on prayer. That's my big focus. I'm just here to hear the the voice of God. Some of you might, you know, might not like that. They think I should be reading like my Bible for three hours or whatever in the morning. And yeah, maybe I should. But right now, what I'm doing is I'm just spending that first 10 minutes just praying and just trying to listen for God's voice before anything else happens in that day. And to me... I'm already feeling that that is giving me the the direction and the wisdom I need. Um, And I want to keep growing it. I want to keep working on this and keep expanding it. And so maybe for you, you're already doing this. And so for you, you're like, okay, I want to expand this up to like a full hour or something. And that is so awesome. Um, And the beautiful thing is here we believe in Sabbath. So maybe for you, you can go even longer on Sabbath and just really try and get into that quiet space with God and taking some time, even after you've had some time to listen, to get a, like get your, a journal and write down what you've heard from God, to get your Bible and to read through a story in the Gospels or to read through a psalm and to just wait and listen to what God wants to tell you about that because I believe that God wants to speak to us today. Um, he's there and he's waiting for you. This is the invitation So if you want to stand to your feet, if you're able, we're going to continue singing this morning. Um, Such an awesome song for this moment. We're going to sing um, still together. So even in this moment, I want you to just bring your week, bring your schedule to God and ask him, hey, look, Lord, where do you want me to spend this? How do you want me to work on my time, Lord? Where is this going for you? How can I hear your voice in my week, Lord?